How am I insufficient and how can I rectify that? That's what you've got. And the thing is, you are insufficient and you could rectify it. Both of those are within your grasp. If you aim low enough. Aim low enough. Have a low enough bar. Why do, you, why do you mean that? Well, let's say you've got a kid and you want the kid to improve. You don't set them a bar that's so high that it's impossible for them to attain it. You take a look at the kid and you think, okay, this kid's got this range of skill. Here's a challenge we can throw at him or her that exceeds their current level of skill, but gives them a reasonable probability of success. I don't know how to start improving my life. Someone might say that. And I would say, well, you're not aiming low enough. There's something you could do that you are regarding as trivial, that you could do, that you would do, that would result in an actual improvement. But it's not a big enough improvement for you, so you won't lower yourself enough to take the opportunity. Well, what do you do when you go and lift weights? Yeah. You don't go and, like if you haven't right, bench pressed before, you don't put 400 pounds on the damn bar and drop the bar through your skull. Right. You know, you think, look, when I started working out when I was a kid, I was, I was weighed about 130 pounds and I was six foot one. I was a thin kid and I smoked a lot. I wasn't in good shape. I wasn't in good physical shape. And I went to the gym and it was bloody embarrassing, you know, and people would come over and help me with the goddamn weights. Here's how you're supposed to use this. You know, it was humiliating. And maybe I was pressing 65 pounds or something at that point. You know, but what am I gonna do? I'm gonna lift up 150 pounds and injure myself right off the bat? No, I had to go in there and strip down and put my skinny goddamn self in front of the mirror and think, son of a bitch, there's all these monsters in the gym who've been lifting weights for 10 years and I'm struggling to get 50 pounds off the bar. Tough luck for me, but I could lift 50 pounds. And it wasn't very long until I could lift 75. And well, you know how it goes. But, and I never injured myself when I was weightlifting. And the reason for that was I never pushed myself past where I knew I could go. And I pushed myself a lot. You know, I gained 35 pounds of muscle in about three years in, in university. But there's a humility in determining what it is that the wretched creature that you are can actually manage. Aim low. I don't mean don't aim. And I don't mean don't aim up. You can set yourself a goal that you can attain. And there's not going to be much glory in it to begin with. Because if you're not in very good shape, the goal that you could attain tomorrow isn't very glorious. But it's a hell of a lot better than nothing, and it beats the hell out of bitterness, and it's way better than blaming someone else. It's way less dangerous. And you could do it. And what's cool about it, there's a statement in the New Testament, it's called the Matthew Principle, and economists use it to describe how the economy and the world works. To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. It's like what's very pessimistic in some sense, because it means that as you start to fail, you fail more and more rapidly. But it also means that as you start to succeed, you succeed more and more rapidly. And so you take an incremental step and, well, now you can lift 55 pounds instead of 52.5 pounds. You think, well, what the hell is that? It's like it's one step on a very long journey and it starts to compound on you. So a small step today means puts you in a position to take a slightly bigger step the next day. And then that puts you in a position to take a slightly bigger step the next day. And you do that for two or three years, man, you're starting to stride. You can make a lot of progress incrementally. You know, once you specify a goal, you don't have to leap from where you are to the goal in one fell swoop. If you could, you probably didn't set a difficult enough goal. It's okay to move, make incremental movement forward. That's why there's another rule here, which is uh, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. You know, if you get the comparison right, you can say, well, here's where I'm headed and it's worth going to. You have to ask yourself that. Is there a place I could head to that would be worth getting to? It's very useful to treat yourself like you're someone you're responsible for helping. And it is very useful to compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. There's no way of interacting with someone, including yourself, that's more productive than to give targeted reward where credit is due, to give credit where credit is due. And you might say, well, how can I treat myself well, given that I'm nothing but a, the embodiment of serpentine errors and sins? And the answer is, well, if you're a little better than you were previously, that's something, really. And maybe that's what you, you want to see in your kids, right? I mean, you don't want to push them too far. You, you don't want to punish them if they haven't made huge leaps forward developmentally, what you want to see is incremental progress that requires some effort. And that's actually what your kids really love too. You know, if they're playing hard, they're 
They're on the edge. They're pushing themselves to develop their skills. Maybe they're playing a sport. They're pushing themselves to move incrementally at the optimum rate. Play signals that you're pushing yourself forward at the optimal rate. Because you can't stay static and you can't absorb too much change at once. How do you know when it's right? Well, it's engaging, it's meaningful, but at the highest level, it's something like play. When you're playing a sport, you want to play against someone who's approximately the same level of skill as you, or maybe a little beyond, right? If you're playing a game with someone who's approximately your equal, then you're pushing each other exactly enough to facilitate optimal movement forward. If you're going to master something, the first thing you have to do is admit to yourself that you're not a master of it already because then you wouldn't have to do anything. So you have to allow yourself to be the fool. And you know, one of the things I've noticed about people who are highly successful is that they will jump into new things that they don't know anything about and be the fool, be the person who doesn't know anything, be the person who's low man on the totem pole, start at the lowest rung and they won't pretend to know more than they do know. They ask the stupid questions that are necessary. They humble themselves in accordance with their novice position. They like they accept that weight. And it doesn't matter if you start at the bottom. What matters is that you're so stupid and blind that you refuse to learn and that you stay there, right? So it's trajectory that matters and not absolute position. And so that's a useful thing for people to know. It's like, of course you feel like a bloody fool when you do something the first time. What the hell do you expect? You are a fool, but that doesn't mean that you can't, you can't move beyond that. Look, every ideal is a judge, right? So you posit an ideal and instantly you're in inferior position in relationship to that ideal and that can be crushing. Okay, so what do you do about that? Well, one answer is no ideals. Well, that's not a good answer because then you don't have anything to do, right? So, so and that deprives you of a main source of pleasure which is observed, uh, generated as a consequence of observed movement towards a valued goal. So. If you have a high goal and you see any movement towards it, there's a potential, there's a really powerful potential kick there. So you don't want to dispense with that. But then if you set up an ideal, it can judge you very harshly. So then you have to rearrange your reward philosophy. And instead of punishing yourself from, as a consequence of perceived distance, you reward yourself for incremental movement forward. And that's not just theoretical. Look, I was stopped by three guys on the street this week, three separate occasions, and they all told me the same thing. They, they had read or something I wrote or listened to something or watched something and that it had been helpful. And whenever anybody says that to me, I always ask them, okay, exactly what was helpful and what changed? Because I want to know what's helping so that I can understand the target and hit it better. All three of them said, I stopped comparing myself to other people. So I stopped comparing what I didn't have to what other people had. I left that off the table. And then I started to reward myself for improving over what I was yesterday. That's profound change because it means that you actually get your reward structure transformed. And that's a big deal because that's, that's your source of positive emotion and enthusiasm, encouragement, all of that. So now you can start to encourage yourself for, for genuine improvement. And it's also pragmatically extremely intelligent because incremental improvement repeated is virtually unstoppable. Like the hallmark of behavioral therapy, that idea. Because what a behavior therapist does is you come and you say to me, things aren't the way I want them to be. And then I say, well, well, how would you like them to be and how are they not that? So we lay out the problem, the territory, and then the next thing we do is lay out a trajectory, which is, okay, well, here's something, you're lonesome, you, you don't have a partner. Okay, so what are incremental movements can you make towards that goal that you would do, that would be helpful? And so maybe you negotiate with the person, because that's what you do if you're a reasonable therapist, and you say, well, look, why don't you, uh, you decide as a consequence of the conversation, why don't you write out a description of yourself for a dating site? Don't post it or anything. Just write it out. And then let's see if you actually do that. And so then the person comes back next week and they say, I did that. And not only that, I posted it. And you say, great, what's the next step? Or they say, geez, you know, I, I just kept avoiding that. And then you say, okay, well, we need to break that down. 
you avoided it. Well, could you write one sentence about who you are right now while you're sitting here? And sometimes they can do that right away, or sometimes they can't. And then you, you make a microanalysis of that. And what you do is you, you reduce the magnitude of the move forward until you hit the point where you actually will do it. And that's like the secret to good negotiation. And as well, if you're negotiating with your wife, maybe you want one of her behaviors to change. Obviously, she has to be on board with that. And hypothetically, that's going to be reciprocal process. But what you want to do is find a small improvement that is measurable, that's implementable, that will be implemented, that you can then reward. That's how you can have your ideal. You, you can have whatever ideal you want as long as you're willing to reduce your movement forward to achievable increments. But that's okay because they compound. And I really learned this as a therapist. It was one of the things that was so fun about being a therapist is you can take someone through this process and start them on just the tiniest goal. You know, and it's, it just seems trivial, but they'll do it and then they start moving fast, faster and faster after that point. Once, once the direction has been established and people make incredible improvement over not unreasonable spans of time, a few months, maybe a few years, but which is not nothing, but it's not decades. You know, it's aim high, but reward yourself for small incremental improvements, especially ones that repeat every day. I think that's one of the challenges we have in the modern era because social media shows us the highlight reel of everybody else's life, but we get to watch our own failings from a front row seat, right? We watch ourselves blunder mm -hmm. through life. We realize just how far away from our potential we are. But nobody else actually knows that. No one else knows the podcast you could have recorded, the business that you could have built, the book that you could have written. In a very, very real sense, you are only ever competing against yourself. It's absolutely right. That's exactly why group categorization of people is so dreadfully wrong. It's like you really are your only comparison group, especially as you get older, because your life is so idiosyncratic and peculiar that, look, you have to care what other people think. It's stupid to think otherwise because you have to be social and you have to be aware of what other people are doing and all of that. So this is psychopathic individuality. And so the, the comparison just isn't real. It can't be sufficiently multidimensional. I've met many people who are very, very rich. You can look at their lives and they have these huge houses and material plenty. And they're shielded from many catastrophes that would hit someone without those resources harder. But their lives are still full of exactly the same troubles that characterize human life in general. And so you, you compare yourself on one dimension. You don't see, well, the person's worked 80 hours a week for 40 years and it's blown all his relationships out of the water. It's like, yes, he's rich, but he's also old now. You know, he's 60. And one of the best predictors of wealth is age. You know, really, do you want to be young and poor or old and rich? It's like, I'd pick young and poor because you can't buy youth. And, and that's something that's worth considering. But you don't know what burdens the people you're jealous of are carrying. Leave it be. It's not, it's not helpful to you to be envious. Here's the deal and here are the conditions. The condition is you have to imagine yourself as if you were trying to take care of yourself like you were someone you cared for. So you could imagine someone you care for, like your wife maybe, and you could think, okay, if I cared for myself like I cared for someone I love, what would I want for myself five years from the road. What sort of person would I want to be? What sort of challenges would I be facing? What would I have around me? How would I like my life to be? But more importantly, what sort of character would I like to be? You have to ask yourself that, you know, and you'll get a vision. And some of it'll be concentrating on the remediation of your flaws, because maybe part of you will go, well, you know, here's some of the things you do wrong that you know are wrong. And here's ways you could sort that up and uh, out and clean it up. You know, you could become a better public speaker, for example. You could take note of the things you're afraid of and that you're avoiding. And you could decide that you're going to face those and fix them. And then on the other side, you'd say, well, you know, wh what are you interested and excited about that you could pursue? And so you want to develop a vision. And it's, it's really you do that in dialogue, honest dialogue with yourself. It's like, okay. 
I'm taking care of myself. What do I want? If you ask someone what they want for their life, that's a pretty hard question. You know, it's so open-ended. It's so large. But then you can differentiate it, you know. People used to come to me as a therapist or as a professor, and they'd say, well, I don't know what to do with my life. You know, I'd say, well, what do you want? Say, well, I don't know what I want. I don't know what to do with my life. It's okay, fair enough. If you don't know what to do with your life, look at what other people do that works and maybe think about how you're doing there. So you could imagine this. What sort of people do you want to be surrounded by? What sort of friends do you want? And what can you offer those people? How do you want your family to be functioning? Now, it'd be your wife and your kids, but also your extended family. You know, how could you repair those relationships or make them grow? What educational opportunities could you pursue? You know, how are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically? What occupation are you going to pursue? And how are you going to make that thrive? And what are you going to do with your life outside of your work? And then, more broadly speaking, you might say too, how could you be of the broadest possible service to other people? Now, each of those is a micro vision, right? So one of the things that kept me motivated as a professor, it's kept me motivated all my life, is like I've asked, how much can I do in the shortest possible time? Like, and that's such a fun game to play. And I pretty much take that question into everything I do. Where could I see this going? And then the question of efficiency, well, that's partly because, well, if you want to do 10 things, you're going to have to do them pretty efficiently because otherwise you won't have the time. But then you get in that challenge mindset, right? It's like, okay, here's an opportunity. Now, to be extremely successful at something, you really have to be hyper-focused on it. And so then you might ask, well, what do you have to be like to be someone like that? And the answer is, well, being smart, that's like pretty necessary. And that's kind of a gift that's given to you by fate and God. Like you can interfere with it, but if it's not there naturally, you know, it's a real impediment. It's sort of like height, you know, if you don't have it, there's not a lot you can do to get it. But then insane dedication is the next thing. Like if you want to be the best of the best, you're going to be working flat out like 16 hours a day, seven days a week, hopefully not exhausting yourself. Some of the changes that you can make behaviorally can change you so profoundly genetically that those changes can be transmitted to your children, let's say. So, you know, that's really something. That, that's about as profound a change as you could possibly imagine.